Hello, my name is Adil Barucha and I'm a gastroenterologist in the Division of Gastroenterology at Mayo Clinic. I'd like to highlight a review on common functional GI disorders associated with abdominal pain in this month's issue of the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Dr. Subanka Chakraborty, a fellow in the Division of Gastroenterology, and Dr. Christopher Sletton from the Division of Pain Medicine and Psychology at Mayo Clinic Florida were co-authors on this review. As you know, and as highlighted in Figure 1, these disorders can affect the entire GI tract. They're defined by symptoms rather than by laboratory tests or x-rays. And this review is focused on the five conditions most frequently associated with chronic abdominal pain, that is functional dyspepsia, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic constipation, chronic diarrhea, and chronic functional abdominal pain. We recognize these conditions are very common and hence have tried hard to provide a one-stop shop for practicing clinicians who deal with these conditions in their daily practice. If you turn to figure two, you will see that these disorders are defined by symptoms. Irritable bowel syndrome is characterized by abdominal pain that is associated two of the following three features, that is altered stool consistency, altered stool frequency, and relief of pain with defecation. By contrast, functional dyspepsia is not associated with bowel disturbances, but rather with upper abdominal discomfort often related to eating that's associated with nausea, sensation of fullness and, and bloating. Patients with abdominal wall pain have pain that often occurs with activities such as vacuuming or, or housework, and they have a positive Carnet sign. Chronic abdominal pain is generally not associated with eating or with defecation. The pain is frequent or, or persistent, and it's associated with a significant impairment of daily activities. And finally, any of these conditions can be complicated by the narcotic bowel syndrome, um, which is caused by the use of narcotics. Figure three shows that these disorders result from the combined effects of biological, psychological, and social mechanisms, that is the biopsychosocial model. For example, in patients with post-infectious IBS, the inflammation often persists long after the infection resolves. The products of inflammation and perhaps bile acids lead to increased epithelial permeability. Um, they also stimulate enterochromaffin cells and activate immune mechanisms to stimulate afferent nerves. And this increased input from the afferent nerves is sent via the spinal cord to, to the brain thereby causing increased sensation. And we also know that reduced descending inhibition, which normally gates visceral sensation in the spinal cord, can contribute to symptoms. The left side of the slide shows that psychological factors such as early life experiences, uh, including abuse, adult stressors, including divorce, and a lack of social support also predispose to abdominal pain. Diagnostic testing should be limited and tailored to the clinical features, alarm symptoms, symptom severity, and response to previous therapy. In most patients, symptoms alone suffice to diagnose functional GI disorders. Patients with alarm symptoms may require further testing. Um, however, most patients with alarm symptoms will have negative test results. And reassuringly, patients who have a negative evaluation have a less than 5% risk of being diagnosed with a structural disease in, in future. What tests should we be do thinking of? A complete blood cell count should be checked in, in all patients. F figure four highlights other blood tests and upper or lower endoscopy might be necessary. I'd like to put in a plug for thinking of defecatory disorders in patients with constipation. Defecatory disorders can often be suspected by a careful digital rectal examination and diagnosed with anorectal tests. 
It's crucial to think of this diagnosis since these disorders are more appropriately managed with biofeedback therapy than with laxatives. How should we be managing these patients? For starters, many of them feel abandoned and undertreated and seek care from multiple doctors with limited success. Physicians, on the other hand, might feel frustrated because of the lack of specific diagnostic tests and or patient dissatisfaction. And therefore, it's essential to establish an effective patient-physician relationship by approaching their symptoms with empathy, reassuring them that life-threatening medical conditions have been excluded after doing tests, educating them about the disease, setting reasonable expectations for treatment, and involving them in the management. The approaches include dietary modification, pharmacotherapy, and behavioral or psychological therapy. As you can see in figure four, these tests and, and, and therapies should be tailored to the symptoms and individual patient preferences and integrated whenever necessary. In our experience, these approaches are very effective even in patients with refractory symptoms. I hope you find the review helpful in your practice. Thank you for listening. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayocliniceproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.